Welcome back to the Budget Gamer channel where we bring you critical and in-depth reviews of just about every indie game we can get our hands on and today we're going to be taking a look at Blue Fire for the Nintendo Switch. And this one might blow your minds for a couple of reasons and I'm not saying every gamer out there is going to absolutely fall in love with it but those who do love it are probably going to love it real hard. Because even for an indie game, in a market that's really not confined by any sort of expectations, it's one of the most unique blends of genres that I've seen in quite a while. But I will get more into a bit of the meta-analysis later in the review. For now, the story pretty much evolves from you waking up as an entity, some sort of character in the bowels of some dark, dilapidated city structure, and that really is all you know starting the game. But exploring inch by inch, discovering combat, discovering character controls, and confronting a few enemies and even NPCs, you start to realize that this gigantic, dilapidated, abandoned city used to be a lot more. There used to be guardians, and the five gods of this shadowy city apparently haven't been seen in quite a long time. And pretty much with only this small bit of dreamlike ephemeral story, you're left to explore the entire expanse of the area and figure out for yourself exactly what it is that you're even supposed to be doing or why you were awakened. Mechanically though, and as you could probably tell from the graphics, especially the designs of the enemies and NPCs, this is a bit of a Zelda-like game. And as such, if you remember earlier editions of Zelda, maybe around the era of the DS, there is a similar combat dynamic with the ability to attack and defend, but no real strategic focus on combat per se. Or that is to say, at least, that the difficulty of the combat is not the main focus of the game. You will be defeating enemies, smashing pots, collecting orbs and ores, and of course confronting the occasional boss in the game, but the real focus of Blue Fire is actually in its platforming. And so if you look at the more modern versions of the Zelda franchise, or even games like Prince of Persia, you may get a more clear association of the style of gameplay that you might be engaging in in Blue Fire. You'll need quick reaction time to be able to gauge double jumps, wall jumps, and wall running in order to navigate through the game's environmental puzzles in order to make it from one room to the next, and discover new abilities to unlock previously unexplorable portions of the map. There is actually a second portion of the game that is both in-game and out-of-game at the same time that does heavily revolve around the platforming. Every once in a while, if you do manage to get yourself into a pretty tricky situation, you might just find yourself a small rhythmically looking cube stationed somewhere that'll act as a void gate, introducing you to a new, somewhat separated level as a platforming challenge. And by running the gauntlet and pushing your platforming prowess to its absolute best, you can unlock new additions to your life bar. And so as you can expect, as you do gain more abilities in the game, these void challenges will get ever so increasingly difficult. Other than that though, there are other RPG elements in Blue Fire. Not only are there challenges to increase your health bar, but you can donate certain orbs at unlockable camps, which are kind of reminiscent of the base camps in Dark Souls, and do have to be paid for to be unlocked, but at an unlockable camp you can not only save, but rest, allocate and assign new abilities gained through capturing spirits, or donate the orbs collected from fallen enemies in order to increase your mana bar. Aside from that, no Zelda-like RPG would quite be complete without some side quests from the NPCs. But one final element of Blue Fire's genre complex is actually the roguelike element. And while this may immediately scare off some players because, let's be honest, roguelikes are a pretty unique type of gameplay, the roguelike elements in Blue Fire are pretty fair. You won't be just going to the end of the game and starting over if you manage to die. There are autosaves every single time you open a chest or accomplish an event, and as I just mentioned, you can pay to unlock certain save points in base camps. But if you do die, you will be sacrificing all of the in-game currency that you managed to accrue up to that point. But thankfully, there is a little shining ghost form left within the area in which you most recently died. And if you manage to find it, you can recover your lost assets. But like most other games with these similar conventions, if you don't find it, or if you manage to die again, all of it's lost. But thankfully, in addition to its appealing graphics, the control scheme for the game is incredibly tight. And so anyone who does find themselves to be a particular fan of technical platforming, Blue Fire does not disappoint. Back to the note of the graphics, though, looking at Blue Fire as a visual aesthetic, it's really gorgeous for anyone who is a fan of those older Zelda titles, such as ones released for the Wii, like Twilight Princess. The graphics certainly aren't true to life, and they more rely on that kind of polygon fill sort of shading, but they come across as fun fantasy and a little bit storybook, 
and give a really great vibe to a game that follows such a shadowy mystical narrative. The audio package for the game as well was really well designed. Every single individual character has their own little speech patterns that they use, even though it's not a true voiceover. Certain areas will have their own music, and of course when you get into an impromptu enemy engagement, the sound palette of the game completely changes. And as the entire scenario of the game is set in such a dark, mysterious vibe, the sound portfolio does really help keep you in that mindset of this impending nature of the game. But as cool of a game as it is, and it is a really fun game, I personally had a great time with it, there are some things that players might want to consider before diving in, especially given the fact that it's an indie game and the price point is a little bit higher than the $5 bargain rack. First and foremost would actually probably be the difficulty level. As a lot of us may have come to expect from the top-down adventure or Zelda-like genres of indie games, and especially for ones that don't really seem to have much of a focus on enemy combat, we do start to expect a lot more focus on narrative. And that does generally lend itself to making the game a little more easy. But one of the ways where Blue Fire really blows the curve out of the water is in the difficulty of its platforming challenges. There are much less puzzles in the game than you would expect from a typical Zelda-like, and they are far less reliant on toggle switches and button presses, as much as they're reliant on almost a super meat boy level of difficulty in the technical platforming. I compared Blue Fire's platforming to Prince of Persia earlier, and I want to clarify that's not exactly a really fair comparison. Because in that particular franchise, most of the technical platforming was really aesthetically pleasing, but a lot of it was kind of automated and a little bit done for you. You just had to put yourself in the right situation and press the right button. And in Blue Fire, this is so not the case. You have to maintain control and really control every dynamic of your character as you try and kick flip off of walls or do any sort of a run jump between some really technical areas, also navigating around enemies. And this does bring us to the second consideration of the game, is the enemy level of challenge. There are boss fights in the game, and I'm not going to show them to you because seeing them revealed for the first time is, is really actually pretty fun. And so I'm going to leave that mystery. But if you're the type of gamer who's a little bit disappointed in very simple real-time elements of combat, such as DS-era Zelda games like Wind Waker, where the actual combat itself is kind of low-key and very simple, then if you've read that Blue Fire was compared to a Dark Souls-like Zelda-like game, you'll probably be really disappointed with the amount of stress and lack of intensity for the combat itself in Blue Fire. And this is likely because enemies in the game aren't set up to be a combat challenge, they're more set up to be an additional layer of puzzling challenge. How do I confront the enemy, keep my health, make it through the platforming, dodge the enemy, and make it to the door I need to get to? And while certainly you can go in and just bloody the walls with the slain guts of your enemies, that's not really the focus. So if that's something you're looking for through a Dark Souls-like challenge game, then again, Blue Fire might not turn out to be exactly what you would expect. And the third one is actually getting into a little bit of the meta-analysis of the game and the strange genre combo that comes together to make Blue Fire. And this is the fact that it's not exactly a Zelda-like, it's not exactly a platformer, and even though it does have roguelike elements, it's not exactly a roguelike either. And when I really sat down and thought about it, how the level dynamics are set up together, how the checkpoints work, and how the interconnected map is all pretty much capped off and locked off by attainable abilities, well, it started to actually appear that Blue Fire might be something akin to a Metroidvania. I mean, when you really think about it, a heavy influence on platform and sometimes a light emphasis on combat, but the use of abilities to lock off and block off advanced portions of the map that would actually be available almost immediately into gameplay, as well as considering the massive interconnectivity of the map itself, well, at a certain point you have to wonder, is this actually a top-down Metroidvania adventure? But while I could potentially talk about that gaming rabbit trail forever, if you are an existing fan of the more higher-end Zelda-like games, then you'll probably have an amazing experience with Blue Fire. And if you're looking for more Zelda-likes, we've got an entire playlist of them on the channel. But anyway, that does about bring us to the end of the review for Blue Fire, now on the Nintendo Switch. So if you enjoyed the review, or especially if you found it helpful, feel free to throw us a like or a comment to show your support, and don't forget to click on that little bell icon when you subscribe to stay updated with the latest content. Because as you can see, there are new and unique indie games coming out literally every single day. And so whether it turns out to be an easy, hard pass, or an absolutely unforgettable gem, chances are, if it's on the Switch, you're probably going to find out about it right here. But anyway, this has been the Budget Gamers, as always. Thanks for watching.